Lonnie, welcome to the Millhouse podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Look, been looking forward to this interview for a while and uh, um, always fun to spend time with you, Andy. Of course. I mean, we go way back, you know, and, and uh, a lot of people know us as being saltwater, a saltwater podcast speaking about, you know, and offshore fishing, but mostly fishing. But two, we want to interview a bunch of guys that uh, that are big bow hunters, which you are. But before we get into the hunting, I just want to remind the people out there that don't know you, and some of the audience uh, will have known your background as a skier. But Lonnie won 20 pro races um, in his career. Uh, he won uh, the slalom title in 1980, uh, third overall in the World Cup, uh, or actually in the pro title, I think it was in the, in the 80, same year. That was 1980 uh, also. 1980 yes. also. Mm -hmm. So you were very... Uh, dominant skier uh on the pro tour but before we get into the hunting I, I just want to go back just a little bit to recap a little bit about who you are because i think what we've done in our previous lives to something that we've excelled in really kind of says a lot and, and paves the way uh and highlights the character that did well uh, in an afterlife if you will with your hunting but i think skiing and hunting uh, was very parallel throughout your career, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Well, I I would say that I feel very fortunate for what I uh, have been able to do with my life. And, and spending the time in the outdoors with skiing and hunting and fishing, I'm I'm not quite the, the fly fisherman that uh, you are or uh, never will be, but I, I have enjoyed the outdoors immensely. And um, I was lucky enough with my ski career that I accomplished a lot. It, it gave me a great start in my life. Um, I was able to, to, to make some money and, and, uh, um, you know, that, that really helped me out for, for a good head start. And, uh, uh, you know, my ski racing career probably took a little bit different avenue than most people. And, uh, that, that had the goal of, of being an Olympic skier, being on the U.S. ski team and racing and winning World Cups. Um, and, and that was my goal when I was uh, in my mid to late teens. And um, I did get named to the, the U.S. ski team one year, and that was pretty short-lived. And I felt like it was really because of political reasons that I didn't get renamed to the team for the second year that I would have been on the, on the, the ski team. And so, um, at that time, it, it, you know, I was kind of at a crossroads, uh, um, after I had graduated from high school, that was my goal is to, was to be on the ski team and, and, um, possibly make it to the Olympics and, and, uh, you know, uh, the end result may be winning a, a medal. But, uh, um, when I didn't get named to the team, I, I, I didn't really know what I was going to do with my future in skiing. Um, I had the chance to, to go to school um, on a scholarship, uh, but I felt like there was still something left for me. And that's when um, I turned pro. And, and how old were you at that point? I was 20 years old at that right. time. And, and So you were still young. I mean, well, and, I mean, not to get too far ahead yet, do you think in retrospect um, you may – have jumped that gun a little bit too soon? Maybe had you waited around another year, you could have made the team and skied in the Olympics? Because obviously in 1980, you won the the World Pro Ski Slalom title. And that was the year that uh, Stenmark won gold and Phil Mayer got right. the silver. Do you think you could have compete, competed against those guys? Well, yes and no. Um, I mean, obviously it's a different format, the yes, pro versus yeah, yeah. traditional slalom um, skiing. You know, I guess I felt like at the time... Um, that I didn't really get a fair shake right. with uh, the pol politics and, and the political part of the ski team. And so um, I just decided that, that uh, I was going to give pro racing a try. And, uh, um, you know, Lonnie Venato was, was not a big name in the ski racing world. And, uh, initially, initially, well, well nobody thank, has thank, a big name initially. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. But, uh, and, and because so, obviously you won a lot and you, you became a hall of fame member. Yeah. The Colorado yeah, ski hall of fame. Well, yeah. Thank you. I, it was, uh, I, that was a great honor for sure. But, uh, um, so, you know, I didn't really think about trying to pursue the, my, my 
my dream and my goal of, of being an Olympic skier and, and racing on the World Cup. But so I uh, decided to, to dabble on the pro tour. And there was a regional tour. Um, I guess you would you would call it more of a of a B tour or um, uh, compared to the World Pro Skiing Tour. It was the Colorado Pro Tour at the time. And I so I, I thought, well, I had a construction job at the time. I'll try, I'll try pro racing a little bit. Well, I went to f the first three races and I won two and was second in the other one. And, and so I thought, well, I better go to the next world pro skiing race, which was, was in winter park the next weekend. And I better go, go try and see if, if I really am doing as well as, as I, as I was. And, and, uh, so I, raced against some of the guys that had won World Cups that, that had turned pro, had won gold medals. Uh, and they were they were some of the best ski racers on their national teams. Well, I qualified and made it into the afternoon rounds um, both days for my first race. And I was off and running. Um, I picked up sponsors. Um, I started to do well that first year. I, uh, I made it into the uh, finals a couple times. and. And it was just my calling. I mean, ski racing, my ski racing career was rejuvenated. Um, the, the pro format, the dual side-by-side -side format, really. Um, the gladiators. Was, yeah. It, 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 mono a mono. And, and you know, I, uh, I, I think I said it in my acceptance speech that uh, um, when I was inducted at the Hall of Fame, I was my own boss. I didn't have to uh, listen to somebody tell me when I had to eat, when I had to sleep, when I had to drink, when I had to uh, train. I was my own boss, and I liked that. And right. and I and I didn't have some, somebody telling me that I simply wasn't good enough to make it because I did. And the pro tour really uh, was an attraction to me, and I did well, and it 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 really helped me out in my my career and. Um, you know, it, it was a fun lifestyle, a fun format, and uh, it agreed with me. Right. Um, one of your best friends that you traveled with, Richard Woodworth, a good friend of mine as well. But uh, you sure. guys were best friends on the tour. And he said when he first got onto the tour and met you, that you had the biggest chip on your shoulder and you were the, the nastiest S SOB he'd ever <laughs> seen. Did, did you always have that chip on your shoulder where you always kind of, I mean, you were, look, if, when you get into a fight, the great adage about who's going to, the outcome of a fight is it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. Yeah. You were a little dog with a big fight and a big heart. Right. Did you always have that? Or did the ski team piss you off to the point that you were going to prove something to the steamboat that had more Olympians than any other ski town in the country? And now all of a sudden, now you're not on the you're not going to ski in the Olympics, but you're going to be yeah. a pro racer. Did yeah. that f fuel the fire at all? Well, I think it did a little bit, but you know, I I feel like that I was always co a competitor. I always had that competitive spirit, and I I don't care if it was it was uh, uh, the finals of a pro ski race against the best in the world, or it was tiddlywinks. I didn't want to lose. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I mean, it was just, I was always competitive, right. and, but I did feel like that, that, uh, you know, I had something to prove and I still look back at it and think, you know, uh, the heck with you guys, the hell with you guys, right. you know, I, I, I proved to myself and I didn't have anything else to prove to the world, but I think I did, you know, that, that, uh, I was a good ski racer and, you know, um, Totally two different formats, but but the drive was there to do well, and, right. and I always wanted to win. Whether it was a ski race, whether it was against that that elk out there bugling that I I wanted to go after, and I wanted to uh, uh, stick an arrow in him, you know, I I or business or anything. I always had a competitive drive to me. I think, and obviously you've you've been very successful as a businessman too because you took on the profession of hunting with your outfitting service for 30 some years, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, and you did very well with that. But I guess the question now <clears throat> is what came first? I mean, you grew up in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, and your father took you into the woods at a very young age. 
Was your passion to hunt similar to your passion to ski race or was what came first in your heart? Well, I would, I would say my, my number one passion was always hunting. I mean, I ate, slept and breathed hunting and the outdoors and, and, uh, you know, uh, um, from the time that my, I could first tag along with my dad, I, I just couldn't wait for the fall. And, uh, um, and, and even before I could have a hunting license, I love to go along. Uh, and, uh, um, um, that, that passion of hunting was always number one. Um, is there, what's, is there any similarities between racing, ski racing and hunting in any way? Well, I think there again, Andy, that, that, uh, you know, that competitive part of the two, maybe it has a little bit of a similarity. You want to win, you want to kill something, you want to go yeah, win a, a and, race. And, yeah. uh, you know, as, as much as I love the, the hunt and being outdoors, I love the success of a hunt for sure. And I love the success of winning a ski race. And so I think that that similarity is there and, and, uh, um, it's, it's, I, I, I love, you know, the, the challenge of sneaking up on an animal that, you know, uh, you know, anybody can get within 200 yards of an animal, but that, that competitive, um, uh, challenge of, you know, how are you going to close that distance, uh, to get within 20 or 30 yards. And still then when you get there, um, it's not a done deal, uh, you know, uh, but th that, that is really a competitive, uh, challenge that I really love about hunting. Also too, you have an animal involved in the whole scheme of things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know how many times that uh, I've gotten close to, you know, even 10, 12, 15 yards from an animal and, you know, you're just waiting for that animal to make one little step and you just think, you know, this is a done deal. And all of a sudden that animal is gone. It's, it's like, really? What, what, <laughs> what did, what just really happened there? Right. You, 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 I knew it was going to happen and it didn't, and it, but you know, that's what keeps you coming back too. And I, I it, it was funny because speaking again with Richie about training, he would say that, you know, he would train all fall for the ski races and you guys would get together in the fall, start traveling and you'd break out your shoes. And he, he said that you guys, your, your shoes were perfect. They were, they were clean. They were brand new. And he'd look and he'd say, man, you haven't trained at all. And he said, I don't, I don't train. And then he'd go into the closet and see your hunting boots. And they were all like torn to pieces. So you were doing all your training, chasing these animals up and down these mountains. That's, that's funny because Richie, uh, who was, uh, you know, still who was my best friend still is probably you know one of my best friends he he always used to joke about that but uh, you know that i had the same pair of of uh of uh training sneakers <laughs> that i for had 10 years for 10 years but, never got uh, dirty yeah but uh yeah he, tell me that tell me about the time and we'll get into the hunting aspect here uh in a second but you guys were coming back, I think, from Japan during the Olympics, and there was a week off from the Pro Tour, and you guys all went to Hawaii. Yeah. Right? Maui, yes. Yeah. What happened to your feet when you were there? Oh, gosh, <laughs> yeah. Well, it was Richie and Mike Hunter, and I, uh, who Mike became a very good friend, who, who announced the, the uh, World Pro Skiing Races. Um, yeah, we, we decided to make a stop in Maui and, and just... Uh, um, recoup and, and, uh, get a little R and R and, and so, uh, went out on the beach the first day and, and I sunburned the heck out of my feet. And so I probably was one of the few people in the world that was back in my room worried about how sunburned my feet were. And I was trying on ski boots going, am I going to be okay to race <laughs> next week? And I'm trying on ski boots in Maui. <laughs> then you walked but, right out of the sand on the beaches the next, the next few days with socks on. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of fun to, to reminisce with friends and look back on our careers um, and, and see these transitions that we went through. I mean, you're a cancer survivor. Your brother just recently passed, as did your mom. You know, that fight in you as a skier and as a hunter, was that fight much different uh, in that war that you waged against cancer? Or, or how did you fight that? What was kind of your mindset to survive that? Yeah, um, 
Yeah, I, you know, I, I've just always really, uh, I think, tried to stay as positive as I can, as I could in my life. And, and uh, you know, it's, it, it kind of goes back to that competitive spirit. Did I have a chip on my shoulder? Yeah, a little bit. Um, but did that, did that drive make me do things harder, stronger? Yeah, uh, probably. But, uh, um, yeah, it's, 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 I've had, you know, some, some difficult times in my life, you know, in the last uh, three or four years. And then my mother just recently in the last six weeks passed away, my brother in the last year. So, um, but you know what, I, it, it's all of those things along with the health issue has really made me feel that I am very fortunate to be here. And, you know, we've got a very short life and we better stay as strong and as positive and live every minute of it that we possibly can. Cause, uh, you know, it's, uh, all of those things have, have really made me realize that, 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 uh, you know, have fun, enjoy the, enjoy the dream, enjoy the road because it's a short one. Yeah, I agree. The, so, um, you take a look at it. I mean, I'm thinking of myself, I'm 67 here in 13 years, I'm going to be 80. Yeah. I mean, that's a scary number for a lot of people. It's not because, you know, their lifestyle is somewhat sedative, uh, throughout those later years, um, being maybe from 55 to 60 on up to 80. They're not really in the high country like we are chasing animals, you know, doing things that are really kind of hard, even when you're really young, but for somebody like you and I, Thir I don't have 13 years. I've yeah. got maybe, I'm thinking eight. Where yeah, I can, right. And that's with, with my fingers crossed, you know? Right. <clears throat> but one of the funniest stories I think I've ever heard about hunting <laughs> was, was your brother, Dirk, <laughs> with the bear he killed. Yeah. Can you, you know the story I'm talking about? I, I do. I, and I've heard, I've, heard it, I've heard it several times. And, and one of our good friends uh, from Aspen, Jim Hancock loves telling the story. I'm sure that's yeah, that's where I heard it. <laughs> that's where you uh, where you heard the story. But uh, um, so yeah, my brother was. I don't think that he had ever killed a bear. He had, and he was guiding an elk hunter um, at the time. But he had a bear tag in his pocket, and you know, um, we would never shoot an, an animal with a client. But this guy was really a good friend of ours and a good friend of, of Dirk's. And, and uh, um, so, you know, Dirk was not carrying a rifle being a guide, but, uh, um, but they ran across, they ran into this bear. And um, Dirk, Dirk uh, told the, the hunter, the client, he says, uh, he says, I've got a bear tag. And, he, and the, the client says, here, take my rifle and just shoot him. And uh, so Dirk did. And, uh, um, so the, the, the funny story about that, that you're getting at was Dirk, uh, it wasn't a very big bear <laughs> and Dirk, uh, said that he always wanted to make love on a bear rug, but he didn't know it was going to be standing up. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a funny story. It's, it's hilarious when I first heard it, but, and, and, and Jimmy Hancock, the way he tells stories, he's so outrageous as, as, as he is. Um, let's get back to those early hunting years with your dad. What do you remember, uh, that was really impressionable for the first time, you know, where you thought, wow, I really want it. This is really cool. I, I love this. Yeah. Um, was there a moment like that where all of a sudden, uh, you know, it was a, it was a pinch me moment. Like I'm going to, yeah. this is going to be a part of my life. Well, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, um, you know, I, I really just enjoyed the outdoors and I, I enjoyed the time with, with my dad and, and, uh, um, hunting and fishing. And then, you know, um, um, you know, and, and my stepfather too, my stepfather was, was, was really instrumental in my life of, of growing up too. And, and, uh, you know, my dad was, um, you know, to, to back up a little bit, uh, um, you know, my dad, um, was tragically killed in a car accident in on the job when, when I was 11 years old. So I had my stepfather, um, to fall back on and nobody can ever replace your dad, but I had the best stepfather in the world and he loved the outdoors too. And Larry, um, was, was such a good, 
good person to be in my life too. But, uh, you know, between my, my dad and, uh, my stepfather and, uh, just family friends, uh, you know, growing up in the outdoors was, uh, it was just, there, there was a lot of, lot of great times. And, um, I just enjoyed it from early years. Right. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because for my fishing life, the first time I saw a tarpon eat my fly in Belize, I thought, oh my God. Yeah. It was, and, I, and I've said this before, it was like getting hit by lightning but surviving. Yeah. And now I want to play this game because I know I'm not going to die, but it's so right. exciting. Yeah, uh, yeah. So Unlike uh, skiing, you can be ripping down the hill at 100 miles an hour and you are risking some very, you know, yeah. tragic right. uh, consequences if you don't do it well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, my uncle, he, w he loved to hunt too. Um, and I, um, you know, after my father passed, I... I tagged along with my uncle quite a bit and, and uh, um, a really funny story too about my uncle when I was tagging along with him before I could uh, hunt myself and, and have a license was uh, I was following him up a trail early one morning and it was just starting to get daylight and uh, um, I think in those days you could have an either sex tag so um, so he stops and he looks through the trees and he sees this brown spot. And of course, so we didn't know if it was a cow or a bull, but it didn't matter. Um, and uh, if, if it did, my uncle didn't care. But <laughs> so, uh, but so he raises the gun and I'm looking and I'm going, yeah, well, I, you know, my, my uncle was a darn good hunter. I'm not going to doubt him. So he shoots and it doesn't move. And he jacks another shell and he shoots again and it doesn't move. He shot three times and that rock never moved. <laughs> it never moved. So that was a funny story. I remember when I was young with growing up. Yeah. You know, it's um, the first time I actually started to get it, connected with elk for me, that was my go-to animal. I mean, I'm looking at your house here. You've got the grand slam of, of sheep. You got a water, Cape Buffalo, uh, a goat, some African animals, big elk. If there's one animal that stands out in this room and in general, what would that animal be for you? Well, I, I really like hunting sheep. The, the North American wild sheep are, are probably the, the, my number one animal now elk are fun to hunt but uh um unfortunately with sheep the supply doesn't meet the demand there it's hard to draw a license um it's hard to buy a hunt they've become very very expensive hunts to buy a sheep and everybody wants to hunt, spend yes. that money on a yeah hunt. exactly and and uh you know i was i was very fortunate that i started out sheep hunting when i was you know, young. And I, I, I shot my first sh sheep of my grand slam when I was 29 years old. And then with a bow, with a bow. Yeah. And then I, I, uh, and that was a doll sheep. And then a couple of years later, I shot a bighorn here in Colorado. And then, and then I shot a stone sheep, um, in the Yukon, um, one year later. Um, um, and that was, so I shot, I shot three sheep in four years. And then I, you know, I had that goal in mind to, uh, to, to try to complete that grand slam. And, uh, but I didn't think that I would ever be able to accomplish it because of how expensive that the desert tag was. And, and I was just trying to draw a license. And so finally I got a cancellation hunt and it was 27 years from the first time or the first sheep that I killed, which was the doll sheep, until I killed the desert bighorn that I was able to complete my grand wow. slam. But uh, yeah, sheep hunting, uh, and, and, and until you do it, um, you don't, uh, the, the, the drive and um, the passion to do it may not be there. But, uh, and there's been a saying with sheep hunters, you either love it or you hate it. But um, I've been, pretty successful on my sheep hunts. Uh, I've been, I've been on just six sheep, sheep hunts. So I wouldn't c call myself a, uh, you know, a, a die in the wolf well, you, sheep you've hunter. killed four out of six hunts. Well, I, and I, I actually did get a, a big horn last year with, with, that I shot with a rifle too. But, uh, um, 
the rewards of sheep hunting are as high as they get. You know, that it's, it's way up here because you work your ass off. I mean, you work so hard. You know, the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into a sheep hunt, um, when you finally get one, it's like, you know, you can sit down and cry because it is so special. Get, get, it, t- walk me through a day of a sheep hunt. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, most of it is, you know, it's backpack hunting. And so you're carrying everything on your back. And, and, and so, how heavy is that pack? Well, it can be 70, 80 pounds, wow. you, you know. Um, and um, so mo- most of those hunts, you're, you're backpacking in, you know, a long ways and like that for, could be 10 15 miles well it could be uh yeah easily easily um you know 20 or 30 miles one way to get into where you hunt and then um you know there's a lot of things that have to go right um uh, like what i can remember with with my doll sheep hunt um the ram that i killed um which was was a a, a very very nice ram he was when i shot him he was he was like number three in the world for Pope and Young. But but we watched that ram for two and a half days before he finally got into a stockable position. And then I made the stock and I, and I shot him. And so um, those rewards are really special, really high. And But, you know, sometimes when you, if you work your butt off and, and how far you hike um, and eating freeze-dried food and living in a little uh, tiny tent on the rocks and... and uh, uh, you know, when it doesn't happen, it's it's uh, tough to accept sometimes. But that's sheep hunting. But, uh, but you told um, me you, you told me your this one that you killed that was the world record at the time. Didn't you have this? You you missed a shot at like late at night. Tell me about that hunt. Yeah, that was the stone sheep hunt, and uh, um, uh, I was lucky to be able to go on that hunt. Um, I. Drew, or actually I won a doll sheep hunt through the Colorado Bow Hunters Association on a $50 raffle ticket to go back to the same place where I had hunted doll sheep. But so um, I had killed a doll sheep. I had killed a bighorn in Colorado. And I kind of, the wheels kind of got to, to turn. And I, and, I, and I talked to this guy that I had already been doll sheep hunting with, that I had won the hunt with, I said, do you think that there's any way that we could trade that hunt out for a stone sheep? Because I thought, well, if I get a stone sheep, right. I'd be one three, away. Three, quarters, three quarters slam and I'd be one away, exactly. And so uh, he said, let me, let me do some checking. So uh, he did and I went stone sheep hunting. And this was on a fifty dollar raffle ticket that I wow. that I had and, and what and what's the value on that if you were to pay well or buy? R- right now stone sheep hunts are in the neighborhood of fifty fifty five thousand oh my god at that time um you know not near that much but uh, um anyway so I went stone sheep hunting and uh, um the story that you're talking about that I told you about yesterday I believe it was but uh, um. You know, we, we packed back in with me and my guide with, with horses and uh, um, got back into the range where we were going to hunt. And we left our spike camp one day, um, left the horses there just with our day packs, enough food for the day. We were planning on coming that coming back that night. Um, but so we had some trail mix, some granola bars, not much, but and just the clothes on our back and and uh some rain gear. And so we got into a place where we, we spotted a, a really, really nice ram, eventually the ram that I did kill. But so we made a stock on him. I made the stock on him and I and I missed him that night at about seven o'clock. How far was that shot? Now, I think it was twenty eight yards. So how'd you uh, miss him? Uh <laughs> excitement. <laughs> the excitement of, of shooting at 28 yards. That's gotta be hard to get close to that yeah, kind of an for animal. Sure. Yeah. So um yeah. So it, it was it was a little disheartening, but uh so my guide was back across this great big valley and uh and so I hiked back and he said, Hey, he says that ram went about two hundred yards and he settled down. And he says, um he said, we got two choices. We can hike back and we can uh, 
stay at camp for the night, which camp was about five hours hike. Wow. So it was seven o'clock, you know, roughly eight o'clock when I got back to him. So, you know, it was going to be after midnight before we got back to camp. And then he said, we can break camp. We'll have to bring the horses down this big, long drainage and back up to get back up to that sheep. Or we can camp here for the night. We'll just build a fire and uh, we'll try to stay warm. And, you know, keep in mind, we had no food, which was, that that's no big deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, we didn't have any food for the night. We'd eaten our, eaten our food. And so we found an avalanche chute. I said, let's, let's stay. Let's see if we can get on him in the morning and, and make one more try. And then we'll go back. And so um, we uh, found an avalanche chute uh, with some firewood. Uh, we cut some pine branches off a tree and, and made us a little bed. And, um, you know, built a big fire and stayed, you know, somewhat warm for the night. We got up the next morning. We started glassing. And immediately right at daylight, we spot that big ram across this great big drainage. How exciting is that? Yeah, yeah. And so... Uh, the guide stayed right there, watched through the spotting scope. I went across, made made a great big loop, got ab- up above this ram, came down on top of him, and I shot the world record stone sheep. And that that you know not only because he was a world record for Pope and Young, but just the the reward of that you know that that we ended up staying one more night, um, you know. Uh, we made that that effort, and the reward was a world record, and it was pretty cool. Um, wow. Yeah, so um, that's that's one of my neat stories about sheep hunting, and they're all great, and you know they're just such beautiful, beautiful, majestic animals. They live in the most pretty, pristine country that you could ever hunt. That uh, they're they're probably my uh, my Your number favorite. my favorite. Although you know, it's elk hunting. I, I grew up around elk hunting, and there's nothing like elk hunting either. So Especially when they're screaming yeah, at you, and you're yeah, actually it's, communicating with yeah, that animal. Yeah. Can you compare the highs to maybe winning a world uh, ski title, as you did, uh, the slalom title in 1980, and that, and that uh, victory yeah, that you had yeah. with that stall, doll sheep? Is it similar? Very similar, I would say. Yes. I, you, know, I, um, you know, there's nothing like winning. Right. It's, it's the ultimate. Right. And, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's probably like, you know, you, you love the outdoors. You love to fly fish you love to tarp and fish. And, and when you, when you catch a, you know, 100, 160 pound tarp and there's probably nothing like that. Well, it's, you, it's, well you know, Delani, I've always be- loved to do things where you've never felt more alive in your life than at that moment. Yeah. That right. You're doing that regardless of what it is. I mean, sure. You know, when you look back, there are going to be certain moments that are going to be like so, you know, so epic that it's hard to, re, you know, uh, right. replicate that yeah. moment. But in a daily life or in a, in a course of a year, we'll spend time in the Keys tarpon fishing in the fall where we're into the elk. Um, I'll be on my motorcycle ripping around. But to have a life where we as outdoors people go through life with our eyes jumping out of our head yeah. half of our lives. Yeah. I feel sorry for the general public who never have really ever felt or experienced anything like that. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and that's and, actually kind of nice because those people are not up in the high country where we are. Yeah. And unfortunately, there are so many people in the high country now, and I don't understand because of the COVID or whatever, like our little ski town of Aspen, Nikki hiked in, 11 miles the other day to get up and out of town and away from people to Snowmass Lake. He gets there and there's 60 tents. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if you're seeing that around Steamboat. I know this three years ago, you moved out of town to get up in this remote area that is just so lovely and beautiful. How do you feel about, you know, the, the encroachment of the numbers of people on yeah. the river and in the high country, hiking and biking? And what it's doing to the animals, pushing them over that hillside, so all of a sudden our valleys don't have the animals that we once had. Yeah, it's you know to me it's it it's really 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 frustrating, and um, you know I hate to see it, and and uh, uh, you know I'm not happy about being 63 years old and getting older, but I am sure enjoying you know the the good times of my life right now. But um, I look back, 
if, if I was 30 years old, knowing what I know now and not having those years, you know, that I've had in my lifetime right now, it would be a huge disappointment to me. And it's, it's sad to see the encroachment of people in Colorado. And, um, uh, it, it has really hurt our elk hunting. And I think the, the glory days of elk hunting in Colorado are over. I don't think that we're, we're going to see, uh, the, the best years that, that we had in the past. And, and, um, you know, when there's thousands of acres a day being taken up to development and the encroachment of people, um, hiking all over the woods, uh, it's, it's really sad for me to see that. And, uh, it's frustrating for yeah, sure. And, is. uh, you know, over here in the steamboat corridor between steamboat Craig and Meeker, mm -hmm. I think this is the, and the flat tops, this is the biggest part of the Colorado elk herd that there is. Yes. Do you see, cause I know in Aspen we've lost Aspenville, we've lost like 50% of our elk herd due to people and the encroachment of people. Harsh winters. Yes. But more importantly, I think it's the lack of habitat, just yes, like fishing. Exactly. Uh, if you take a look at conservation in the world of fishing, it's based on habitat, long liners, the depletion um, of, of the herd, if you will, which we have here in Colorado with the elk in the Aspenville Valley. Do you see the elk herd over here maintaining its number? Well, I, it's, that's, uh, it's kind of an interesting question because to me, Yes, I, I think that the numbers are going down, um, but uh, I think that there are more elk um, staying on private land now, right. now than ever before because, uh, you know, they're being harassed all the time, right? all the time. And, you know, the, 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 the cows, the cow-calf recruitment is, is low, you know? Right. I mean, the cows are aborting calves. They're... And this is this is my opinion. I'm not a wildlife biologist, but there are boarding calves. The, the calves the cows are stressed out. Um, you know the calves are being chased by dogs. The the humans are are stressing them out. Um, and like you say, uh, their habitat is being eaten up right. every every day. Right. And uh, um, so uh, you know, and and uh, I think at some point. That, that Colorado is going to have to change their thinking on on uh, how they manage elk herds, uh, and and Colorado has always managed for uh, quantity, not for quality of elk, other than a few trophy units. But um, it's it's always been a, a a cash cow operation for the Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and I think that that's you know if if they're going to want to continue to have Lots of wildlife in Colorado. I think there probably that's going to have to be some management changes. It's also true too that you know you want to have a sense of of a relationship with the outdoors and the mountains. Yeah. And it's hard to say you can't go there. You know how do you monitor access to the mountains? Yeah. With people going up and camping and enjoying their lives and. You know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's really a difficult thing to, to juggle, you know, right. I, I see. Well, let's get back to some, some more of the, the, the fun times of, uh, of your hunting career. What, um, you were talking a little bit earlier about stalking an animal and, and feeling, you know, get within 25 yards, 20 yards, 15 yards, and you lose that shot. What do you think is some of the most, or the more important things to be able to be conscious of, to be a great hunter. I mean, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Right. You can tell people how to hunt, but what is it that you learned that made you the great hunter that you are? Is there any one thing that stands out? Well, I, you know, experience probably number one, you, you just have to spend a lot of time in the woods and, uh, you know, um, you know, that, you can get lucky every once in a while and stumble into an easy one, but uh, um, you know, you you really have to spend a lot of time. And um, you know, as as I said, I think you know, uh, there there probably aren't too many animals that I can't get within two hundred yards of. But but closing that gap um, to you know to that bow shot, there, there's a lot of things that have to go right. You know, you have to play the terrain. 
Um, you've got to play the wind, obviously, number one mm -hmm. thing. If, if the wind is, is not right, I don't care you know, what happens. You've it, got you, no chance. You, you've got no chance. And, um, but, but, you know, you, you, you'll make a lot of stocks before you make one work. Right. And, you know, that all comes from experience. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's very interesting. Um, because Jay Scott did a, a podcast with one of the very, very famous hunters. And he said, you know, like, uh, Randy Ulmer, you yeah. know, he's in the woods for 40 days stalking sure. before the opening morning. And the great hunters usually have these animals so patterned that their, right. their hunt is over in the first morning. Yeah. Yeah. Because they've been there and they, they see what's going on. Yeah. And it's like fishing, you know, I can tell everybody what fly to use and where to throw it and how to strip it. But unless you're in front of that fish yeah, a lot, years and years and years and years, will yeah. you ever get really good? Yeah. Yeah. Obviously. Um, you but know, you were talking too. I mean, I mean, obviously you, you started a, a guiding business that was a very successful guiding business. Right. Right. And you were talking about just a little bit earlier, these guys would never have a chance to harvest an animal, but yet they come back for 20 years and 20 years later, they still wouldn't be able to go do it on <laughs> yeah. their own. Yeah. Well, and, and, uh, yeah, you know, um, I've had a lot of satisfaction with, with guiding people for sure. And, uh, uh, you know, it has taken away a little bit of my own hunting time, but, um, you know, I, there again, I, I, I was fortunate that I found a profession that I lived in the outdoors. Um, you know, there were times that I didn't want to drag my ass out of bed at four 30 in the morning and go put up with that client. But you know what, once I got out in the woods and that sun started com coming up and I looked around and I saw God's creation and everything started waking up and that first elk bugled every day was worth it. It was wonderful. It was, it was a great, great job. And, and I loved it. And, um, you know, I did make a lot of dreams come true with clients and yeah, some of those guys, uh, they hunted with me and got to be good friends with me for, you know, over 20 years. And, uh, um, but, uh, like you say, you know, if you didn't lead that horse to water, um, he wouldn't drink or, right. you know, but, uh, for sure, um, you know, if they weren't guided, uh, they, 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 they probably wouldn't kill an elk, but, but those, those satisfactions of, of taking that hunter out there and, uh, you know, you're doing everything except for pulling that trigger, drawing that bowstring back. And then he shoots that elk. And that satisfaction to me as a guide was well worth it. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. I loved every bit of it. And, you know, uh, to, to see the satisfaction, uh, uh, and the smile on that hunter's face was, was great. That meant really a lot to me. And, uh, was uh, that, was that kind of a hard decision to make to, you know, you're talking about God's creation and you were saying earlier that you were proactively involved with your hunters killing like 1800 elk. Yeah. Did you ever feel bad about that? Um, no, I didn't really. I mean, um, you know, yeah, that was, that was a number that I, that I came up with of, uh, after I had, uh, finished my guiding and my outfitting business and I sold it here a few years ago that I went back and I, I, I figured out how many clients I had roughly at each, um, hunting camp that I had. And, and I came up with about 2,200 hunters that I had introduced to the, to, to my business over the years and then figured out the success of each place where I hunted and came up with that. But, you know, and to answer your question, um, you know, I, I always look at an animal and, and I love animals. I love watching animals. I love watching their habits and, and their movements of what they're doing. And they are beautiful creatures. Mm -hmm. They are beautiful creatures, but I love to hunt and I love to put, I love to put, uh, meat on the table. And it, it's a management tool for hunting. So I, I, I yeah, the, the I walk herds up, have to be called. Obviously, sure, sure. I walk up to every animal, and you know, I do look at that animal and think, you know, that is that is a beautiful, beautiful creature that you just hunted and you just harvested or right. killed. Right. And um, 
you know, uh, I'm not a bloodthirsty person that goes out on every hunt just to kill an animal. But, right. but it is obviously, it's a management tool. And for the people that don't understand it, um, they're oh. crazy. Yeah, they just don't understand. They don't understand, that. Yeah. honey. Well, conservation is based on hunters and fishermen who spend all the money to preserve these animals yeah. and save the ocean, sure, um, uh, because of the joys that they have being in the in the great outdoors and the relationship that we have with animals and fish yeah. for sure. But two, there are a lot of people that are being more and more conscious of what they eat and and having their hands on organic, clean food. And that's quite appealing as to that whole concept that we're out there harvesting animals and we know where that meat came from and we get to cut those steaks and yeah. and we get to take care of that, of that food yeah. that lasts over a year. Sure. Yeah, sure. And, and, uh, you know, um, Africa is really a prime example too of, of, uh, you know, the, uh, of hunting of, of what the American dollar does with, those people that are so poor over there and that, that, that the hunting money, not it, it, it not only is it, it a conservation tool for any place you hunt, but the, the money to help out those, those people in those small villages is huge. Yeah. What's it like to hunt in Africa? Africa's awesome. I, I love Africa. I mean, I see some animals and, that yeah. you've taken from there. Yeah. You know, for, for years and years, I, uh, I, I didn't have a lot of desire to go to Africa, but after I went the first time, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, the, the amount of game there, um, that you see, um, and the culture, the culture is, is really neat to see, you know, to go and visit an African village and to see the way those people live very, very simple lives, lives that they lead. And, but they're very happy, happy, right. happy, happy people. But, you know, um, but the hunting money that that goes to Africa from the American hunter, and uh, you know, a lot of people there again, you know, they they don't agree with 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 hunting wherever it is, but it's huge in Africa. It's huge. Are you going to go back? Well, I've been four times, so I've been pretty fortunate that way, right. and uh, um, I'd always love to go back. Is there um, an animal out there that you haven't that you haven't hunted that you're desperate to well i was supposed chase. To, yeah um uh i was supposed to go to uh new zealand my girlfriend and i were supposed to go to new uh new zealand this spring and uh we couldn't do that to hunt stags to hunt red, uh, red stag. uh, yeah red red deer stags uh, okay. and to hunt tar and so uh i'd love to see new zealand and uh um I don't know, Andy. I, you know, uh, there's there are lots of lots of animals that I'd I'd like to hunt. Uh, uh, you know, elk are pretty special too. And <laughs> I'm I'm going on a pretty neat elk hunt uh, in September this year uh, on a, a twenty thousand acre ranch up in Idaho that has trophy elk, and I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, um, you know. Uh, Sheep hunting's great, but hunting trophy elk, it's going to be really cool. Right. And I'm looking forward to that one. So uh, I don't know if there's really any one special animal that, I, that I'm that i after other than the next one. Right. You know? it's uh, How hard was it for you to sell the outfitting um, business that you had for all those years? Well, uh, you know. Is this I'd... a change of, I mean, our lives are basically books with a number of chapters yeah. Was that chapter just depleted? Yeah, Your it, brother had passed. It was time to move on or what, how'd you come to that? Well, I had a guy that, that uh, approached me about getting into the outfitting business and, and, uh, um, you know, he was, he was talking to me about, uh, um, you know, how to do it, where to go to, to try to lease a ranch or, um, you know, and, uh, um, I had no desire to, really to get out of the business. And uh, we kind of started talking, the wheels kind of started turning, and, and uh, he said, well, what about your business? And I said, hmm, interesting. And because uh, I, I figured I'd probably be manage my, managing my outfitting business and managing uh, guides in a, in a rocking chair. That's <laughs> right. You know, so you but, did. But because I, it was something that I really liked. It was easy. It was, it yeah. was easy. I, 
you know, and, you know, I, I really worked hard for about three or four months out of the year. There was always something to do with the business, right. but you know, I never had an eight to five job. And so it was, it was really a, a, a pretty attractive, attractive job. Right. And, um, but you know, when this guy approached me, I thought, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's time. It's, it's time. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, to get back with what we had talked about earlier with, with a lot of things going on with, with right. health issues, with losing, losing, um, my mother and my brother. And, uh, you know, I just said, life is too dang short. Yeah. It is time to go out and enjoy it. And it, it you know, I had 31 years of, 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 uh, really enjoying the outdoors right. and sharing it with other people, but it's my time now and I'm going to enjoy it. You know, um, it's interesting. We were speaking this last year about how much we ski <laughs> and how, and how much we like or dislike being around people. <laughs> Tell me about your answer <laughs> on that one. <laughs> well, um, yeah, it's, uh, um, I don't know whether it's, uh, maybe a little bit of old age creeping up or, uh, or, you know, being around people a lot, dealing with, with, uh, uh, the public and, and, uh, um, I don't know if I would, I guess I could use the term babysitting some, right. But, uh, uh, you just want to be left alone. I, I kind of like, I, I like my alone time. Yeah. Now. I, and you it's, know. it's funny too, because I feel the same way about you. You know, our careers were probably about the same length of time, possibly. I mean, I retired at 28 because of an injury and I got involved with the team when I was 16. So that was 12 years. Mm -hmm. And do I like skiing? I like skiing now briefly, but if I take a look at, you know, I've skied down at the face of Aspen Mountain since 1960. Yeah. I've skied every turn on that mountain. Right. And once as a skier, once you take the clock away. Exactly. Yeah. How many professional basketball players go out and shoot free throws? Yeah. You know, which exactly. was cool watching the ball go in the hole. I mean, I love the, the, the sensations of the wind in my face and carving that turn and ripping down a hill. But when you remove the calibration of how well or poorly you skied, it'd be like a, a pro golfer yeah, playing golf, but taking the cup away. So you have no longer a standard of par right. by which you can assess how well or poorly you played. Right. Yeah. Is that a fair assessment? I, I would say it's very fair. And, and I don't think uh, people understand that until they walk in our shoes. Right. You know, and um, yeah, it's, and the beauty of hunting, we still have things to chase. Yeah. Yeah. There it's a, it's a great life after that competitive world yeah. that, that we were in. Yeah. That it's not the same run. It's not the same turn that you made down Aspen mountain or that, that I made down, uh, the face of, of, of the, of steamboat ski area. Sure. And, um, but you know, when you're walking through the woods, um, you know, it's not the same woods, it's not the same trees. And it's not going to be the same animal uh, around right. the next corner. He, right. You know, he he could be, you know, the bull of the woods, the, the the biggest bull that you've ever seen. And that's what makes you want to keep coming back and keep going into the woods. Where, you know, skiing, uh, I'm bored with it. Yeah. I, I'm bored with it. I'm bored with you know, uh, again, um, the people, um, and I really don't like the cold weather much anymore <laughs> <laughs> sounds like you need a home in florida like yeah, i have really well Lonnie, it's great to hang with you um you know thank you for your this time thank you for yeah. your friendship and uh yeah. thank yeah. you for allowing us to come over to you well, to see you, you yeah, in your it's, beautiful uh, home it's it's fun it's this has been great and it's always great to see you you've been a good friend for a long time you always i've be. been a big fan of yours forever i love you brother i love you too yeah thanks thanks, thanks. Well, so it's West Side Story.